And I present to you Dino Daisovi. Thank you. My name is Dino Daisovi. Um, you might remember me from other past hits such as blah, blah, blah. Um, actually, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, this actually makes uh, 10 years since my first presentation in Vegas, way back at DEF CON 8. So I've been talking about how to exploit memory corruption issues for 10 years now. So it's uh, kind of a little crazy. So let's see how things have changed. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about return-oriented exploitation. And what this does is this actually me is meant to encompass uh, a variety of techniques. Um, with, you know, going back to the basic return to libc, as well as the newer, flashier, trendier return-oriented programming, which is now still about like three years old. And one of the things I want to point out is that actually I'm not going to be talking about any new techniques in this talk. Um, so I'm not going to be revealing anything, you know, very whiz-bang. But what, I'm, but what I hope to show is that three-year-old techniques are enough to own IE8 on Windows 7. And here's how. Um, in particular because a, um, you know, if you start looking at like return-oriented programming, a lot of this flashy stuff, a lot of people t try to make it look more complicated than it is and have gone through and written compilers and all this stuff. And whereas my infrastructure that I'm going to be talking about is I deliberately took the simplest implementation possible at every turn um, so that my, one, so that I finished my script in one weekend and two, just to kind of show that you know, this is the level of exploitation defense these days is that it doesn't require really bringing a lot of force to bear. So <clears throat> let's kind of give a little context to why this is necessary. So, uh, you know, way back in the dark ages, also known as a few years ago, if you had full control of the EIP register on, I'm going to be talking about x86 the whole time so we can just assume that. Um, if you had full control of EIP, you were just really close to arbitrary code execution. However, now with uh, exploit mitigation such as DEP, ASLR, non-executable memory, um, full control of EIP is sort of, you know, just one step in the stage to getting a payload running. And so this stage between full control of EIP and running your, you know, your Metasploit payload or whatever um, is, gonna, is the return-oriented exploitation stage. And so what this means is that attackers now must identify supplemental vulnerabilities or other issues in order to enable the exploitation of the memory corruption vulnerability that they found. And what these issues are, are uh, memory address layout disclosure vulnerabilities. Um, some, t some people call these memory leaks, but unfortunately that kind of collides with what programmers call memory leaks. Um, so it's kind of like a memory information leak is another good term for it. Um, and the other issues you can find are the availability of known executables. You know, if you know that a certain version of a certain DLL is always loaded at a fixed location in memory, you can use that as material for your return oriented exploitation stage to get your payload running. And so some of the options here are one, find DLLs that don't opt into ASLR, whether these are third party or whether these are built into the operating system. Two, you can use something like a JIT spray, which lets you place, just spray the heap with executable code that you can partially control that'll allow you to bridge to your shell code. Um, or kind of the older, about two years ago, Mark Dowd and Alex Sodorov presented a way of using uh, .NET user controls in IE to place executable code at a fixed location in memory. So any of these types of issues are now required to exploit memory corruption vulnerabilities on a modern operating system like Windows 7. So what I talk about today is give a little more background on where exploitation came from and where we are now, um, give more detail on what I call return-oriented exploitation, and talk about my, uh, my toolkit that I call BISC, uh, which stands for Borrowed Instructions Synthetic Computer, or actually the, the, the C word actually kind of changes. Sometimes I do computation, sometimes computer, whatever I feel like when I'm making the slides. Um, or the alternate title is ROP in Evenings and Weekends, showing how easy it actually is. And I'm going to talk about how we can use these, this, these kind of type of toolkits to enable exploitation. I call these the return-oriented exploitation strategies, how you can enable an arbitrary payload to run. And then I talk about how you can use this to exploit Aurora on Windows 7, and I'll do the obligatory demo where I will show a web browser, click a button, everyone sees a calculator, and we clap. So we're all, we're all on the same page with that? Cool. <laughs> and then I'll try and draw some conclusions from that. So where are we today with exploitation? Um, 
with, but like with memory corruption and exploitation, what, it's one of these things that just never dies because everyone, I mean, like I've talked to so many people for, you know, for a long time that have always said, you know, we assume this would be over in the early 90s. And then people were still doing it in the late 90s. And people were like, ah, after, you know, 2000s, we're still going to, you know, buffer overflows will be dead. And then after DEP and ASLR, buffer overflows will be dead. Well, buffer, like, you know, the, the traditional buffer overflow may be dead, but memory corruption issues are still very much here. They just kind of change. And if you actually look back at the decompiled Morris worm, you will see that the way that it executes, the way that it does the buffer overflow uh, for the finger D, um, despite some descriptions that were, uh, were wrong, uh, mostly because it was space alien technology that fell in people's lap and they had no idea what this was. Um, but basically, if you look at it, it's the exact same formula as Aleph 1 published um, you know, eight years later in FRAC. Basically, what you're doing is you're writing machine code by hand, and that's your shell code, and it executes the exec VE system call with bin sh to give you a shell. And basically, you put a bunch of knobs before it just because you don't know exactly where on the stack it'll be, and you overwrite the return address with the address where you think will be in the middle of your knobs. So it's basically the exact, it's been the exact same thing for like those 10 years. And this technique, which was lost to time, was rediscovered by Thomas Lepatik uh, in February 1995 and published a bug track in how he exploited a stack buffer overflow in NCSA HTTPD. And he's like, he was kind of working through it and he's like, oh, you can do this and do this. And he wasn't really aware that he was doing the, basically the exact same thing but for a different architecture that Robert Morris had done years before. But f finally with the FRAC article by Aleph One, kind of was democratized. People started finding these bugs everywhere. And we're like, all right, stack buffer overflows. Those are a problem. We just got to find all those and we'll be good. But then we learned that, no, actually not just stack corruption was exploitable, so was heap corruption. And so another piece of space alien technology fell from outer space, and this was Solar Designer demonstrating how to uh, exploit heap buffer overflows by overriding the next and previous pointers of freed, memory ch of freed chunks in the heap. And this kind of took a lot of people by surprise, and all of a sudden heap buffer overflows are exploitable. And um, you know, even around this time, there were academic projects, for instance, I remember seeing one that would allocate, would take all stack allocations and put them onto a heap, and they said, because heap exploitation is not exploitable. That came out like a few years after this. It's like, you should read bug track. Um, and then we said, all right, heap overflows are, heap stack and heap overflows are the problem. Then, integer overflows happened. And these weren't, weren't overflows in the traditional sense. They were more integer wraps. They would cause a buffer overflow later on. And so then we started looking for these in a lot of, uh, a lot of web servers, a lot of other things like that. Um, and so now, basically, this is you know, pretty obvious stuff. Um, we found that these bugs are everywhere. Worms destroyed the internet. Somehow we're all still here and still using the internet. Um, but this caused you know, one of the biggest corporations to take a big turnaround and actually say, all right, we need to get these, get these out of our code we have the SDL. And the SDL has three, in my mind, three main pillars. One, secure coding. We need to make sure the quality of the software we write is of high enough, is robust and it's high enough quality to eliminate vulnerabilities before they're written. Two, we need to audit our source code before we ship it. Um, we need to, you know, if there are any uh, vulnerabilities that have been written, we need to actually find them before we ship them and they end up on a customer's, uh, on a customer's system. And then, just in case there are latent vulnerabilities, because you know, theoretically that can happen. There will be exploit mitigation technologies that will make exploitation of those more difficult. Um, and so the exploit mitigation actually is a pretty important thing because it is an acknowledgement that we can't actually find and fix every single vulnerability. And especially with client-side applications, if you look at, you know, I think Charlie Miller's recent talk, a lot of the, the bug mining talks that were going on today, um, they're talking about how they have 60,000 crashes and maybe 10,000 of those are exploitable. And if you think that the winning strategy is to report, find, report, patch, and patch each of these vulnerabilities, it's not gonna, that's not ever going to happen so for these client-side applications. So in my mind, exploitation mitigation is sort of, and privilege isolation, sandboxing, all this stuff is kind of the better way forward. And so exploit mitigation that was implemented in uh, Windows XP SP2 was sort of the first um, acknowledgement of this. And this included a number of things. And the number of mitigations that um, have been included in modern operating systems, <clears throat> such as Windows, have increased with each release. And what this does is this makes exploitation more difficult. You know, each, each mitigation is sort of forms a tapestry that will eliminate or make exploitation of certain types of vulnerabilities more difficult. And this protects the stack, the heap, exception handlers, you know, n random executable memory, and so on. Um, 
And what this does is this basically winnows down the, ex the, the, uh, the situations that are exploitable. And so if you have, you know, if modern day and age, you find a just vanilla stack buffer overflow, the stack, uh, a stack cookie will effectively make it impossible to exploit. So the technique of return address overwrite, boom, that's kind of dead now. And now with heat, with heat protection uh, with, and safe unlinking and all those technologies, overwriting the heat metadata on a free block, um, well, that's no longer exploitable. You know, and then we, you, attackers sort of move on and iterate to the next technique. They discover another technique. It gets mitigated and we sort of do this dance. Um, where we are right now is at, near the bottom at the application specific data overwrite. Um, because DEP and ASLR have sort of mitigated a lot of the other things. And now what's common is overwriting C++ V tables, which are application specific, and overwriting the function pointers there. And one of the things to keep in mind with these mitigations is that they actually require cooperation between a lot of parties. And this is actually where a lot of applications fall down because they'll include old code, new code, third party code, third party plugins, and not everyone may use the same compilers and same flags, so you won't get all the, um, all the best mitigations. And because there's some that require cooperation from the operating system, such as heat protection, SEH chain validation. And there are others that require recompiling your code, such as stack cookies, safe SEH. And then some others that require the application to opt in. Even though they are provided by the operating system, the operating system isn't going to force it on every application. So DEP and ASLR in particular on Windows need to be opted in by the application. And for end users, like if you're, say you're like an IT administrator and you're building like a golden build for an uh, enterprise, it's actually somewhat difficult for you to go through and find what mitigations are active in your configuration of Internet Explorer. You need to look at what plugins do I have installed, you know, is the application compiled to safe SEH, do all the modules, you know, opt into DEP and ASLR, is it running with DEP or permanent DEP, is it possible to load modules that don't opt into ASLR or DEP through a variety of means, all this stuff is, um, is possible. And if you look at, you know, what might, some might consider the gold standard, we look at IE8 on Windows 7. You know, this is all Microsoft code, this is all, all should be safe. Well, it uses the complete suite of exploit mitigations, but still that's unfortunately not enough. Um, because if you install any third party plugins, there's a chance that one of them ha will have a module that doesn't opt into ASLR. And there are a number of common plugins that have module, like have DLLs loaded at fixed locations that an exploit developer can use to enable, to basically to bypass DEP and ASLR using the things that, um, that I've, I'm talking about here. And there are even ways to do this without any third party plugins. Um, if you're interested in that, um, I believe a researcher, Shai Bao Chen, is presenting that at XCon next week. So, uh, unfortunately, Black Hat didn't accept his talk, but it would have, it's some pretty cool work, so you should check it out. So, let's talk about return oriented exploitation. So, now, having full control of EIP is not direct arbitrary code execution because you used to be able to jump straight to your code and or do kind of a little more clever things like a register spring where you jump to some code that will go indirectly through a register to your code. Um, now that you have uh, ASLR or library randomization on Mac OS X, which is a kind of a knockoff version of ASLR, um, you're not going to be able to do this. Um, so in even EIP pointing directly to a data that you control will not give you arbitrary code execution because DEP, DEP or NX will make that memory page non-executable. And if you're looking at like embedded systems like a mobile phone, you might have issues like, for instance, the ARM has separate instruction and data caches. And so your payload might be in the... Um, in the data cache, and when you tell the processor to go execute this memory, it'll execute, it'll pull, it'll fetch data from main memory, not your shell code from the data cache. So it's kind of tricky. Um, so what you need to do is turn EIP control into arbitrary code execution. And so it requires a little extra steps. The first step is the stack pivot. And what you're going to do is you're going to leverage full control of EIP to get full control of the data pointed to by ESP. And once we have uh, control of the stack data, we're going to use this to, uh, ex to control execution to then give us enough control to have full, um, you know, full arbitrary code execution again. And this is the return oriented exploitation step. Oh, go back. Uh, all right. So this first step is called the stack pivot. Or, uh, some people call it the stack, stack flip. I call it stack pivot. Um, same thing either way. And what you're doing is you're taking you need to get ESP to point to data that you control. In the vanilla stack buffer overflow from our days of yore, you got that for free. Well, now you have to pay for it. So what you need to do is find a simple instruction sequence that will point ESP into data that you control. And there's a number of ways you can do this. You can find a, you know, something that, wow, my machine is lagging like crazy. Um, you can uh, move, um, 
yeah, move, e move a register that you control to the stack pointer and then return. You're probably not going to find this very often. You can find an instruction sequence that'll adjust the stack pointer by a constant amount. That's also kind of rare to find one that you, um, that you really like. My favorite here is the exchange EAX ESP followed by a RET. Um, because it's uh, a pretty short encoding. Anyone tell me how many instructions that encodes to? 